Welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church. We're here to prayerfully build relationships so that we can impact lives with the transforming power of Jesus Christ for the growth of God's kingdom. I want to just share a couple of announcements with you as the ushers come forward and the worship team takes their positions here on the platform. Um, first of all, this is not in the bulletin, but you got this handout. And it is about an alpha training that is coming to the Northland in Cloquet on March 24th. And uh, whether you are familiar with Alpha or not, uh, but you'd like to maybe know more, it's from 9 to 3, and we would love to have you there. Alpha is one of the primary ways that we can, in a non-threatening way, share our faith with those that we invite into our homes or into our church. And so um, I strongly encourage you to make plans to attend this conference. Marsha Nelson is our coordinator, so talk to her if you want to attend. This is just a correction from last week, and so if you weren't here last week, pay no attention to this next correction. <laughs> this little piece of paper that I gave you last week, um, the bottom part is the correct dates, the top part is not. When you go from BC to AD, the numbers go from to AD, they go large to small, and from, um, or from BC, they go large to small, and then, yeah, after, after his death, it goes from small to large. And so this little picture we showed on the screen, it said B.C. when it should have said A.D. And the bottom has it correct. So if you still have that, if you even noticed it, just wanted to make the correction. A couple of you did, and that's why I'm making the correction, okay? So thanks for your sharpness. And then just a couple other announcements. Secret Par Pal Party is right after church today. So if you're involved with that, am I correct? Oh, there's no... Oh. 2-18-18. Oh, that's what that is. I was like, at 2-18 today, no. Well, now you know the secret power paddle party is coming, so no excuses. Our annual meeting will be held next week on the 11th of February, following the morning worship service and a potluck, and so we hope that you will be a part of that. Uh, today, there's a Super Bowl party that none of us are really interested in anymore, but we can get together... <laughs> and enjoy the company of each other. It starts at 5.30 with food and games. Uh, and I believe, oh, and also um, you, some of you are wondering uh, when your end of the year giving statements are gonna arrive and, and we've changed over system as you know and so they will be ready this Wednesday uh, by club time. So just, I know it's a little later than the 31st of January but they are coming and you'll have them in your mailbox by Wednesday clubs. That's all the announcements we're going to share with you at this time. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, it is all about the cross. And without the cross, we would have no hope. Without your sacrifice, Jesus, we would have no salvation. This morning we call this Communion Sunday because we get the joy of taking the elements that represent your body and your blood. But Lord, you call us to examine ourselves before we do that. And so I pray at this moment we'll begin that examination process. And if there's something, Lord, that you're not happy with us in, that we will claim the truth that says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all of Help us to be open and honest about that which your spirit may speak to us about. And confess it so we can take of the elements freely. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that has never given their life to Christ, they've never repented of their sins or surrendered to you and asked you to be Savior in their life, I pray today your Holy Spirit will speak truth, your truth. Reveal, Lord God, how easy that is and yet it's a commitment that you expect us to live by all of our days. Father, I do pray for those that aren't here. They may be traveling, they may be at some event, they may be sick. We pray, God, that you will be with them wherever they are and let them know that we are praying for them and let them know that you are there. I pray for those that are going through sickness, Lord going through pain and suffering of some sort. You are our God. Lord, we read in the scriptures regarding the bread. It is through your stripes that we can 
expect healing. And so, God, we praise you that through your body and your blood, you have made everything available to us for salvation and for dealing with life issues. So, Lord, I just pray that as we worship you, you will be glorified. But, Lord, your spirit will begin to speak to us about what we need to hear as individuals today in regards to our relationship to you. This I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. waving like a banshee and I forgot something. So I just want to run something by you real, real quick because I'll make reference to it at the end of the service today. Um, we have sent out about 70 emails inviting you, our congregation, to experience and to explore for yourself uh, in your homes what's called uh, Right Now Media. It is a Christian media site that is not, you're not going to get bombarded with emails and so forth. It's paid for through the church we're trying this out to give you opportunity that every day you can have some Christian teaching in your home. It has Bible studies for men and for women and for couples. It has, uh, it has different topics, all topics of life, whether it's financial management or it's marriage encounter kind of things or, or whether it's dealing with relationships in church. It has a whole series for children, uh, which Veggie Tales and all kinds of children's programs and so if you're one of those parents that say, oh, I just need to put my kid in front of a television for a moment, put him in front of this, and that way it will be something that's godly rather than something that might not be. And so it's, if, if you've gotten this email, I encourage you, open it up, follow the instructions. You have to, you have to put a couple of sign-up things on there in terms of your name and that. And after that, you can click it on just like you would if you, if you have a subscription in Netflix. It's designed in the same fashion. And you just go through and take whatever you want for yourself. You can put it on your phone. You can put it on your, if your, your television, on your computer. And we're offering this to you as a gift so that you will take advantage of these resources that go above and beyond having to come into the church. We want you to keep coming back. But, but you don't, you, every day you can pull something up. If, you, if you're having issues with something, you go, oh, I wish I knew something about that. You can have this, go look on the sidebar, and it'll give you all the topics you can choose from, okay? So I just wanted to make sure that you knew you got that. Of the 70 names that we have sent to, five have signed up. So right now, the majority is, eh, I don't understand it. I'm not getting involved in that. 
Okay, we're, we're paying for it. We just ask that you, well, actually, you're paying for it because it comes from the offerings. But you, you don't have to pay extra. This is a gift to you uh, with, a, with a bulk payment from the church. And so I really encourage you to investigate it and begin to see what's there for you and your family. Okay? All right, let's continue to sing to the Lord. Would you please stand?
How's that? Man, how long have I been off? <laughs> well, that's a question for the ages, actually. So anyway, Adam and Eve were created to have a relationship with God, and they said no. They'd rather have stuff for themselves. And as a result, humanity's relationship with God was broken. So the story that we are going through um, demonstrates to us, in the lower story, God's patience and the lengths that God goes to to redeem and re reconcile mankind back to himself. Now at this point, uh, we're into the, the prophets of the Old Testament, and at this point, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel, um, they're, they're no more. They rebelled against God so much that they no longer exist as nations, as a nation that was called the nation Israel. The southern tribe, Judah, the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin are in captivity by the Babylonians and they have been for 70 years. But now the prophecy of deliverance that was given prior to the captivity is being fulfilled. It's time now to return to Jerusalem and begin the temple's restoration. The one that was violated and destroyed basically when they were invaded. So we're going to look at the significance of the temple. We're going to actually do it in two forms. First of all, we're going to look at the Jerusalem temple. This was the place where the glory of God's presence filled the temple. You'll recall in the book of 2 Chronicles, it says when, in chapter 5, verse 11, when the priests came forth from the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without regard to divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph and Heman and Jedathan and their sons and kinsmen, clothed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets. In unison, when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify the Lord, when they lifted up their voice according, uh, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. That was when the temple was built. And then when Solomon dedicated the temple, it said Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priests again could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All the sons of Israel seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave praise to the Lord saying truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. It was a magnificent piece of architecture with in jewels and gold, minerals, and all kinds of things. But what made it important, what made it special for the people of Israel was that the presence of God, quote unquote, dwelt there. Now we know that God dwells everywhere, but this was said to every other nation, our God, this is where we meet our God. And so this temple has significance because everyone that comes recognizes that God is the center of our lives. But the temple was defiled when the people chose to be depraved. Jeremiah tells us that in chapter 7 verse 30. The sons of Judah have done that which is evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house which is called by my name to defile it. They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they will, bear, they will bury in Topheth, because there is no other place. The dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. 
Then I will make to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land will become ruined. That's not the prophecy you want to hear. But God said, I am fed up with this continual rebelling. Either love me or I will have to reprimand you. The people eventually repented. They were a repentant people, which leads to a reconciliation with God. Judah did spend 70 years in captivity. But in Jeremiah 33, verse 1, we read this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time, while he was still confined in the court of the guard, saying, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you. By the way, this is true all through the scriptures and all through our lives. God says to us, Call to me, and I will answer you. I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. For thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are broken down to make a defense against the siege ramps and against the sword. While they were coming to fight with the Chaldeans and to fill them with the corpses of men whom I have slain in my anger and in my wrath, and I have hidden my face from this city because of their wickedness, behold, I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel, and will rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me and by which they have transgressed against me. It will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth which will hear of all the good that I do for them. And they will fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I make for it. Now there's the prophecy that now says, you know what, you messed up but I'm going to give you the opportunity to come back and I will bless you as you seek my forgiveness and be reconciled with me, your God. Now, they are then sent back, and this is where we are in our reading. They're, the king of Cyrus says the people of Jerusalem, the, 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 the people of Judah says, you go back and you rebuild the temple. And, and people that are around there and people that remember that temple, they help pay for it. They help provide the animals for the sacrifices. They'll help provide the goods and the expenses. And you go back and you build that temple to God. Now, why he did that? Uh, because God directed him to do it, even though Cyrus was not a godly man. He was a man that believed in many gods. But he saw the hand of God on the people of Judah said, you go back and make a name for your God, which will proclaim what God has done for me. So they went back and they began to work on the temple. And that's in Ezra then chapter 3. We read that God is dishonored when the temple restoration is ignored. When all of a sudden they stop. And there's a lot of stuff that we're going to, I'm going to just fill in the blanks. But let's read this part first. When the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of the Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' households and old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish between the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. The reason why some were weeping is they remembered Solomon and the temple that he built and the one that they just laid the foundation for was not going to be like that and so they were lamenting 
that the original temple would never be recaptured. But the others who hadn't seen that temple, they were praising God, they were joyous because the temple was being restored in Jerusalem. Listen, I don't want to get political, I'm just going to make a comment, but please understand the big story of God. When our president made the edict that the capital and, and that our ambassadors were now going to proclaim that the capital is in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, that was, that was not just a political move. That is the large story happening. Because now someone besides Jerusalem has recognized this is where the temple belongs. And so there's more coming. The second coming is getting closer. Okay? And so we still see God in the, in the upper story working through mankind in the lower story. The people, however, were intimidated to stop the work. In Ezra 4.23 it says, Then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' document was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe and their colleagues, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by the force of arms. So Artaxerxes kind of made this edict and said, you can't be doing this. Even though Cyrus told them that they could. And so there's this, there's this confrontation where people are watching their every move. And finally they come with force and they go, we're not going to let this happen. And so the people of Israel, Judah, became intimidated by this force and they let the work of rebuilding the temple slide to the point of 16 years. So think what can happen in 16 years to a foundation that has been laid. A while ago, a long while ago, early 90s, I went, uh, my wife and I and family, we went and candidated in a town called Billings, Montana. And while we were in Billings, they gave us a drive through the town. And as we're driving through one road, there was this two-story building, all white, kind of uh, concrete, and it had all the doors and all the windows cut out, but there was no doorways, there was no framing, there was, there was no windows, it was just a shell of a two-story building with all these openings and doves and pigeons flying in and out. And I said, what is that building? And they said, well, that was supposed to be the Christian school. And as they started working on the school, they started having problems among the school members and the board, and they had a split, and so they didn't have any money, and so there's the shell of the school. That never happened. There, in modern days, is an edifice that says, we can't get along in the name of Jesus. And so here's this big building sitting out there on the side of the road that everybody in town knows the Christians tried to do that, and they weren't able to do it. Same thing happening with the temple. After they let the work go, then growth started happening between the rocks and the mortars and all that kind of stuff, the foundation that they laid, and pretty soon it just became a vacant lot. A huge vacant lot, but a vacant lot. And all the people that were not from Judah basically could say, they really don't love their God that much, and he's not that powerful, because look at this 16-year-old hole in the ground. people refer, preferred to focus on their self. We read in the book of Haggai chapter 1 verses 1 through 8 and we're talking now about Judah. In the second year of Darius the king on the first day of the sixth month the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel who was the son of Shethiel the governor of Judah and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest saying thus says the Lord of hosts this people says the time has not come even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvested little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Long story short, Judah finished the work of rebuilding God's temple. There's a lot more there, so read the book of Haggai and Ezra, the Chronicles, kind of fill in the gaps. But they finally, after 16 years, said, we need to get this done. Now, the reason I don't go into the story more is because in Sunday school, we've covered most of that. But I want to look at the parallel between the, the Jerusalem temple and the significance of the human temple. The glory of God's presence fills the temple, just like in Jerusalem. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, it says, But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. You and I house the Holy Spirit. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the parallel here is, are we paying attention to building that temple? To keeping it holy? to seeing it glorify God, that people look at the temple and says, God dwells there. The temple is defiled when people choose to be depraved. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 says, all things are lawful for me. I can do anything, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but has also raised us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Oddly enough, in the Old Testament, the things that they worshipped when they started to bring God into the foreigner's worship process, the things that they worshipped was immorality. And in the New Testament, when the people slid from God's truth, the thing that they began to be involved with was again immorality. And yet immorality, yes, the worst kind is the kind that involves our own flesh. But it is immoral for us to sin against God. It's immoral for us to live a life that is not glorifying God. But a repentant person leads to a reconciliation with God. So initially, when we recognize we are born into sin and that we are sinners, and we ask Christ to forgive us, and we repent, meaning we turn away from that sin and say, God, I want you to cleanse me. I want you to be my Savior. I surrender to you in that. It says that God will forgive us of all our sins and adopt us into his family. We are reconciled with God. But once that happens, we don't just sit now, go back to our houses and begin to build our own panels, if you will, in our own homes, and our own lives, the things that we want to do. Now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we want that temple to bring, be built up and glorify God and demonstrate to others that God dwells here. A repentant person leads to a reconciliation with God. Acts 2.38 says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When a person prays to receive Christ as their Savior and accepts Him, surrenders to Him, I should say, as their Savior, we are baptized, we are immersed, if you will, into Christ. And the same way that Jesus died and was buried, spiritually we are, buried, we are dead to self and alive to Christ. That's what water baptism 
symbolizes. And that's what God wants of us. That is one reason why he gave us the communion table, to remind us that we need to keep coming back and confessing anything that has been an offense or a sin against God. God is dishonored when the temple restoration is ignored. We who are followers of Christ, those who profess to be followers of Christ, we can be intimidated, and we have been intimidated to grow or to show Christ. There have been times, and everyone here, nobody, there's no exception, myself included, there's times when maybe we feel we should be more bolder in our faith, but we keep it to ourselves because we don't want to be embarrassed or intimidated. We have come, in many, many cases, Christianity, Christians have become convinced of the need to be sensitive to the separation of church and state because we're intimidated rather than standing for truth. What God wants is for us to stand boldly because our lives are not our own. We are bought with a price and that price was the life of Jesus Christ. People prefer then when we, we don't take time to develop the temple of the Lord, people then prefer to focus on self. In the story that we've been reading, we read about the fact that when they were intimidated not to com continue the work, they said, well, that's not going to work, so let's just build our houses. Let's just spend time looking at our place. Let's put in that new kitchen cabinet, you know, that nice jacuzzi tub. I realize I'm elaborating. But let's, let's put these things that make our house look nice. Let's focus our energy and our monies on us. And unfortunately, God's temple just isn't going to happen. And that's when God came to the prophet and said, go up to the mountains get the timbers, come down here and finish that temple. Because God is more important than your house. The people of the nations that surround you need to recognize that God is the most important thing in the world. In Hebrews 5, verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers... I'll, I'll read this as though I'm talking to you directly, which I am, but I mean as though the scripture we're talking to you directly. Okay? For though by this time, if you are a follower of Christ, you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now, I don't know if you are in that category. You do. You know. You don't have to have someone come up alongside you and go, so where do you think I stand? You know where you stand. And I know where I stand. The Christian life, building up that temple of the Lord, it's an ongoing practice. You don't get to a certain point and go, ah, it looks great. It's done. It's never done. But God does expect us to have progress. What Hebrews says is that for many of us who have been faith in Christ, we ought to be teachers of this, not students, not babies who still need a bottle to get through our lives, but rather eating meat and potatoes of the Word of God. The temptation is to be intimidated by others in our faith and therefore just focus on self. And it's as ancient as the rebuilding of the temple itself of Jerusalem. But the message of God has always been the same. If we do not fortify our faith, we will be prone to destruction by our enemy and a disappointment, disappointing to God. 
that's where God wants us. So I got a question. These are this is kind of an application self-help, if you will, okay, before we get to the table of the Lord. I just want you to check these off. You don't have to show anybody uh, unless you want to. And you can even go like this if you're embarrassed because you start realizing, oh, that doesn't look so good. All right? But these are just some things that we can pertain, we can focus on, we can participate in to help build up our faith. Daily devotional. Do you have a daily devotional? I decided to start off with one that's a lot of people do because I don't want to embarrass this. How about personal prayer time, where you're actually not just a quick prayer, but time with God prayer? Christian radio teachings or music. Do you attend a prayer group? Do you have family devotions in prayer to establish that it's important to the kids? Christian TV or teaching. Sunday school. Sunday worship. Service projects. Serving God by helping others. How about daily reading your Bible? Or weekly Bible study with somebody. Or online. On your own. And now you have the opportunity for Right Now Media. In your house, you can have something every day. Speakers like Robbie Zacharias, Beth Moore. There's a lot of good speakers and teachers in that stuff. Now the reason for this, turn in your assignment. No, I'm just kidding. The reason, the reason, for, this, <laughs> the reason for this is just to do a self-evaluation. What am I doing? Individually, What are you doing as an individual to build the temple of the Holy Spirit in your life? Or are we kind of focusing on our own panels and our own houses and all that stuff? And yeah, God, I come to church and I pray when I need you, but I'm not really trying to build the temple. Only God can answer that with you. But that's why we're coming in part to the table of the Lord. Because when we come to communion, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 that we are to first examine ourselves before God so that we don't come to the table in a manner, unworthy manner, that puts us in the same association with those that cried for the death of Christ. And so this is one of those moments where I'm going to ask you quietly to pray if there's something there that the Holy Spirit reveals to you or something you already know and he doesn't have to say anything, you want to confess that to him, that's awesome because he said he will forgive us of our sins. But don't let it stay there. In other words, don't say, okay, I messed up and then don't change that pattern. But rather, how, Lord, can I build up the temple of the Lord in my life? So I'm going to, we're going to, I never know who's in the church uh, on Sundays, elder-wise and deacon-wise. There, we got one, two, we got three elders and a couple deacons. And so I'm just going to have our elders come forward. We're going to serve you where you are, okay? As we're singing, we'll just bring the elements to you. So I'm going to ask our elders to come up right now, please, so that I can see you and know that you're there. And one deacon at least. Steve, you're there. Can you come up, please? And worship team, you can come up as well. It's good, David, that you can come up and walk and do all that stuff. Praise God for that. That's awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to be singing a song, and I'm going to have the elders, uh, or these men pass out uh, the bread, and then they'll follow it immediately with a cup, okay? But do me a favor. Don't eat those right away. So you're going to have the bread come through, and the cup's going to follow right, on, uh, right away. Take an element of each. And then just hold it. And then when we get done serving everyone, then I will give you instruction and we will eat and drink together as a family. And that will give you and I a chance then to pray if you haven't had that chance yet to really examine yourself, especially based on the word today, to say, Lord, is there something there that I need to be, I need to hear from you and you want me to respond to? And you'll give you the chance and opportunity to do that while we're singing for you. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer.
Heavenly Father, you are a great, awesome, wonderful God, a Savior. You are truly above all else. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. There is no one like you, not even close. And Lord, today this message, it, it could have an impact. I mean, it could, people right now could be feeling uncomfortable with its message. And that's your spirit. Just wanting the best of each one of us. So Lord, as we pass out these elements, as we sing, I just pray that people will pause and listen to your Holy Spirit. And if there is someone here today that's never given their life to Jesus, that they will know by your divine direction that they can do that right now by just confessing their sins to you and saying, God, forgive me and come into my life. I surrender myself to you. And Lord, for those that have already done that, help us to retune, retweak, if you will. We want to celebrate the table of the Lord. We want to truly celebrate the goodness of Jesus dying for us and being risen again. But we also want to take this moment to reconcile ourselves to you, renew our relationship with you in that area that you would direct us. So Lord, hear the prayers. I know you do. Let nobody resist you here, but rather embrace you and say thank you for this opportunity to renew ourselves in you as your spirit speaks to us. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start playing, and then as, as um, we begin to sing, as I mentioned, these guys will take one plate of bread and one plate of the cup, and they will pass them to you, and then please do not eat the elements. Take of the elements. Take a, a, also a cup, if you would. Yes. And then when everybody's served, then I'll give you further instructions. Thank you.
Father, we truly are grateful to you for your sacrifice. You were bruised for our iniquities. By your stripes, we can anticipate healing, not only of the soul, but of the human body. And so, Lord, we thank you for the bread that represents your body that was bruised for us. Let it, as we take it, solidify, Lord, the renewal and the renewed commitment that we have to you and through you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. Father, we also thank you for the cup. The cup that represents your blood. The only thing, the only thing that pays for the penalty of our sin. Thank you, Lord, for paying this ransom and getting us out of the bondage of sin so that we can follow you and live in righteousness and declare the glory of God. So, Lord, be blessed as we take the elements. But again, Lord, let it be a, a sealer of today's commitment and recommitment to follow you all the days of our life and to build this temple so that everyone around us can see that God dwells here. Thank you, Lord, Jesus, for your sacrifice, your death, your shed blood, your burial, but also, hallelujah, your resurrection. Let's drink together. Scripture says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. We're going to sing one final song. I'm going to ask you to stand. But if you would like prayer, if you have some ailment in the physical body or emotional or spiritual, and you want prayer, we truly believe that God, Christ, is for the body. And so in that back room in the corner, if you want to go back there, there'll be men and women back there to pray for you and with you about the need that you express. You can go there while we sing this song together. theory we believe that in truth and so for these people that have come forward Lord are in the prayer room for healing we pray God that you will bring your divine power upon them that Lord we pray in the name of Jesus that you will bind the elements of sickness 
or the enemy, if, if the enemy is using something against them, we command the enemy to be silent and to be broken in Jesus' name and call for the you, O oh God, to bring the healing balm of Jesus into their life. Thank you, Father, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace.